The History of Clothing, Part 1. The fashion of past eras appeals to the imagination, a tale's prompting bewilderment, often nostalgia. People in olden times not only looked different, as we see in paintings, sculptures and photographs from past epochs, but they also expressed their social status and their national identity differently. Just like us, they look to fashion in order to satisfy various human and spiritual needs, yielding a melange of ages and changing customs in the unchanging human desire to be attractive. This particular desire to look attractive is what distinguishes the fashions of Europe, the fashions of the West. Beautiful European attire is particular in that it requires a person to reveal its beauty as opposed to the Japanese kimono, which looks stunning when hung flat against the wall, as do many traditional costumes. An 18th century cap or ball gown from the bustling period of the 1870s. In order to exist, they require a body, they require a face, they require a specific person. This relationship between fashion and the individual person started very early on. On 12th century foundations of Polish churches, we see women founders dressed in court gowns with long, wide sleeves. These sleeves droop completely to the ground and have very extreme forms. The phenomenon of fashion quickly appeared in Poland and at a time which is often referred to as a dark period in Polish history, a time when districts were greatly divided. Meanwhile, it appears that these novelties from many areas of art, culture and court culture were quickly adopted and convincingly reflected in works of art. In Poland, the feudal ladder wasn't very developed. As a result, the differences in dress, detailing, between the chivalric class and the noble class weren't specifically defined and weren't absolutely essential. The nobleman's kaftan was the kind of attire that was equally applied to noblemen in the countryside as well as to provincial governors. That which distinguished people of different fortunes and influence was the use of different types of fabrics and embellishments, even though the style of clothing was the same. Takie same. Zresztą ten um, sławny, uh, ta sławna szlachetka... The famous noble saying, pawn yourself but place yourself, which was very often used in reference to the realm of clothing, could have had a strong effect within the noble class, that equality reigned, at least theoretically. It was as if everyone felt obligated to meet a certain standard of complete luxury. Poles were eager, and it was men who spent a lot of money on these sorts of goods. Mr. Pasek beautifully expressed this fact in his diaries, regretting that things which could be used for many years are very hastily exchanged for new things, because they become outdated. Te wydatki 
These expenses ruined not just smaller, but larger fortunes as well. Polish diarists, such as the underestimated Kitowicz, had an excellent feel for the functionality of clothing as a symbol of status. Admittedly, this was not formulated within the category of contemporary sociology, but they did register the process that fashion continues to develop until it reaches the common people. If a given thing is accepted and copied by too large a group of people, then it stops being the desired element of distinction and people who have the means, the ambition and the will to present themselves as belonging at the top of the social ladder immediately abandon it. At times it came about in an extremely spiteful way because influential men would find new novelties which were then adopted by those who were poorer. But as soon as they were, the richer men would pass the things down to their servants and, as a result, they forced their followers to do the same, even though their means were considerably smaller and they couldn't do so with the same ease. Jan Pasek wrote in his diaries, What do I remember of change in the fashions of dresses, hats, boots, swords, twills, and of each apparatus for war and home, even of hairstyles, gestures, one's gait, and one's greeting. Keeping up with fashion, in which the magnate set the tone, exemplified the ambition of noblemen, especially by those in the court. This was an incessant chase. As the novelty started to be received, noblemen would renounce it as a thing of new ideas, and an item bought not long ago would be given to servants, forcing followers to do the same. And so, as Pasek rightly noticed, a fashion lasts as long as it doesn't get passed down to the common people. The tension between native attire and foreign attire was reflected in even the most intimate realms of life. This is how Jędrzej Kitowicz describes the influence of the fair sex on the adoption of foreign dress. There were two factors how women induced an abhorrence towards Polish dress in men. The first was that Poles, who carried themselves in the Polish way, were seen abroad as unpolished in the manners of courtship, with women brought along by fashionable men as a great courtesy. They behaved with old Polish manners. The second was that he, who presented himself as Polish, had to keep his mustache and couldn't shave it off without looking like a fool. Nothing was more repulsive to the female sex than a mustache, especially when they had a sufficient number of foreign suitors without mustaches, who were just as powdered, styled, corseted, and perfumed as the women. The supporters of strong, real power often dressed in Western fashions. Thus it was that the noble class often did not like the fact that elected monarchs wore foreign, Western dress in private settings. On the other hand, everyone was aware of its national, and military symbolism. During the Chmielnitsky uprising, for example, Jan Kazimierz, in order to spur the nobility to battle, wore a Polish uniform, a kaftan and a delia, the traditional Polish costume, and in this way encouraged noblemen to fight. Later, after the victory and the signing of an accord with Chmielnitsky, he returned to his foreign attire, eliciting many negative comments. A great scandal was caused when King Stanislaw August Poniatowski presented himself in foreign rather than Polish attire, even at his coronation. During the election same, this matter had already become a very hot topic. The king was put under pressure to add a law in the treaty obligating him to wear the kaftan and robe, but the king did not agree. And during the coronation, he appeared in a white silk outfit with a striped overcoat. Comments of those who are relatively supportive of him were such that the outfit was better suited to a theatrical performance than for an important ceremony. Because attire was the symbol of these fundamental traditions, the conflict between reformers 
and traditionalists was in the long run played out on the grounds of national dress. Exchanges of malicious opinions were renowned between the king and Prince Radziwiłł, Mr. Lover, who epitomized the old Polish way of being, living and thinking. When the prince once appeared in the court in a very ragged kaftan, and the king brought the matter to his attention, the prince replied that he was wearing the robe as a descendant of the governor of Vilnius. It was a clear but very impolite allusion to the less magnificent royal ancestors. It's interesting to compare the portrait of Prince Janusz Radziwiłł, known from Henryk Sienkiewicz's Potop, painted in 1630 in Leiden during his studies abroad, shown wearing French court attire according to the latest fashion of the day, with his portraits painted 20 years later as the governor of Vilnius, where he is seen only in Polish attire. Please notice that Polish dress didn't always take the form of the kaftan and the robe. Here we see him in the first figure, a fur-lined coat and a representative wrap known as the delia, which had a large fur collar, long split sleeves, which were often worn over the shoulder and clipped under the neck by a large decorative button. Here the prince demonstrates the beautiful accessories that were worn with Polish clothes. Łukasz Górnicki in Polish Couriers painted such a picture for us. Today there are so many uniforms that the number is uncountable. This one done in Italian style, that one in Spanish, another in Brunswick. Old and new, done in the style of Cossacks, the Tartars or the Turks, and other uniforms are such that I don't even recognize. In About Improving the People's Republic, Andrzej Fritz Modrzewski added, It looks unbelievable when in one house and family each dresses differently. One in German attire, another in Italian or Turkish, and yet another in something else altogether, as if they had been born at opposite ends of the world. Another thing is just as incredible as when in the morning one wears an Italian hood and in the evening strolls in Turkish clothes, in a pointed cap and red and white hobnailed boots. In the Polish nobleman's wardrobe, we find a diverse assortment of elements that make up their garb. On one hand, they represent various imported fashions, and on the other hand, they represent the evolving national dress which appeared under influences from the East, came via Hungary, as well as through the reign of Stefan Batory, whose military fame played a large role in having Poles accept the clothing styles of the Eastern provinces. They were aware of this by saying that clothing is different from everything. It is long and is similar to Dalmatian or Hungarian. These diverse trends coexisted for some time, and, as I've mentioned, the choice of a certain garb was an expression of personal taste, not necessarily a political statement. This situation changed quite rapidly when Sigismund III took the throne. On one hand, he strove to limit noble freedom, but on the other hand, in his private life, he dressed in Western fashions. Polish nobility associated this disliked monarch and his infamous impulses with his foreign attire. When this conflict between the noble class and the king was presented in satirical categories, it was introduced as the Battle of the Pointy, the short Spanish beard, with the Polish mop of hair, which, incidentally, 
was of Tartar and Hungarian origin. Given this background, it is easy to understand why the national dress shaped itself only among men. Women followed Western fashions with a longer or shorter delay, incorporating both native and imported elements, but generally following the direction of European fashion. Men, however, wore uniforms which, in the eyes of Europeans, appeared very exotic. Polish legates, through their official journeys, strengthened the notion that even though Poland was a Christian nation, Poles carried themselves like the Turks, and as a result, their attire was different from that of the rest of Europe.